Hey, good morning, everyone. Um, as Frank said, uh, in my current life, I am the PDF architect for Adobe Systems, uh, which certainly is we're going to talk about PDF and iText today is one reason I'm here. But actually, Bruno and I and iText go back to, I think, around 2001, a uh, very long time. Uh, prior to my returning to Adobe, uh, I actually ran a consulting business called PDF Sages, and we provided consultancy to iText and actually were the first company to do commercial licensing for iText. So I have a very long history um, here, so I'm very glad that Bruno invited me and that I can share some things with you folks today. What Bruno asked me to talk about and what I spend a lot of my time doing is in the area of standardization. I mean, how do we take PDF and make it a required part, a mandated part of the world we live in. So standards are things that you deal with every day, but sometimes you don't even think about it. Measurement units, you know, I come from America, so of course we still deal in inches and feet, and here in Europe, you actually understand the real world and deal in the metric system. Um, I, of course, have to remember to change my outlets and plugs as I travel throughout the world. Um, even something as simple as the, the gauge of railroad tracks is standardized. You know, just things we do on a day-to-day -day basis are all part of making sure that things actually work together and play together. And it's important in the software industry as much, if not more, than other places. So Frank actually came, uh, gave a good example this morning about uh, invoicing, and electronic invoicing. And he talked about a report from AIM, which is an American um, organization. Uh, in America, we don't do standards as well as they do in other places in the world. Uh, for example, we don't have any concept of standardizing this idea of electronic invoicing. And because of the way we're structured, it probably wouldn't happen. But here in Europe, there actually is a standard. Um, there's a current standard for electronic invoicing. It's done by a group called SEN. Uh, and then there's another one that's in development that's part of what's called a large-scale project uh, here in Europe. So there's already in here and elsewhere in the world this idea that we need a standard. We need a way to make sure that we can exchange these electronic invoices. It was a great example. As I mentioned, there are lots of organizations that do this. Every country has their own individual standardization group. Um, Europe actually has a few of them. Um, the e, you have SEN, as I already mentioned, you have Etsy, um, the UN has UNCEFACT, the ISO, which is the one you'll hear a lot about today, because um, it's the one where PDF plays, and various other ones. And each one has its own scope, whether it's the entire world, it's Europe, it's Japan, um, and the like. And it's setting those needs and those requirements for that particular area. But Let's start digging into the important stuff. Let's talk about PDF specifically and how PDF plays into the standards world. So let's sort of look at PDF as the big picture and why we even care, why there even was a need to do this idea of standardizing. I mean, PDF, as you may know, is coming up on its 20th birthday. That's pretty old, um, especially in the software world. And uh, you know, Adobe controlled it for a long time. We'll talk about um, where the control is today and where it's moving to. But it was doing fine. Why did we need to move into this world of standards? Well, the reason is that PDF has become, over those 20 years, the digital envelope for all of your content. So it started out, of course, as a very simple, very basic, we might say, static electronic paper metaphor. But over the years, it's really come to hold all of your content. Video, audio, 3D, file attachments, live forms, interactivity. We talked about digital signatures this morning, the ability to um, guarantee your content for authentication. Encryption and DRM for protecting the rights of your content. So no matter what it is you want to store, maintain, distribute, PDF is there to help you with it. And that's great um, from a standpoint of a single format being able to handle all of your needs. But if you're a specific industry, 
For example, the print industry. You're an archivist. You're an engineer. You don't want the entire world in your documents. There are things that just don't make sense. There are things that you don't want to see. On the other hand, there are things that are optional in PDF in general that you must have in every one of your files to ensure reliability and guaranteed. And that was the impetus for the standardization of PDF. And in fact, the first one, and we'll talk about each one of these in turn, was PDFX, the need of the pre-press and printing market to guarantee reliable printed documents, to ensure that somebody could make a document, send it to a printer anywhere else in the world, and ensure that what came out the other end was exactly what the person saw when they sent it to them. And over time, that's evolved into each of these other market segments that have had needs for specialization within PDF. Now, normally, when we talk about these standards and we talk about this idea of standardizing PDF, most people think that that stops at the file format, that we're really only talking about what goes into that container, what's allowed or not allowed in that container. But the fact is that each one of these standards actually has two components. And that is not only the file itself, but the viewer as well. Just because you have a PDF viewer does not mean that that viewer is going to view every PDF, especially these ones compliant with standards, in the right way. Because the standard tells you how to take that data that's in the file and display it and process it correctly. So it's a two-part process for every one of these standards. I'm going to make a PDF-A or a PDF-X, and I'm going to need a viewer that's compliant as well in order to have a complete and total solution. And that's a very important thing to take away um, because, as I said, most people don't think about that other half. So let's start looking at them. Um, I'm going to try to bring them together and go through them somewhat chronologically, but also, I think, at least from my standpoint, in terms of importance, or I think the ones that you will probably be most interested in or take away from. And of course, I'm sure that you come from different market segments, different areas, so if I don't spend as much time on a standard that's important to you, I'll apologize in advance. All right, so let's talk about PDFX. Maybe, there we go. So PDFX, as I said, was the first standard. It goes all the way back to 1999. Um, and these are, you'll hear me call them subset standards. And the reason is because each one of them took the whole PDF and brought it down into a subset. So I said PDFX, the X stands for exchange or specifically blind exchange. The idea began, as I said, send that document anywhere in the world and sure it can be printed. This is for the print industry. So we wanted to take out a PDF all of the things that weren't useful for printing. If a file has a password on it, chances are I'm not going to be able to print it. Certain colors, um, printers are, uh, if you've ever looked inside your printer, you've, you've exchanged ink cartridges, you know the printers work with cyan, magenta, yellow, and black inks. They don't work with red, green, and blue as we're used to on screen. So they wanted to ensure that the colors made sense. They wanted to ensure that you knew exactly what size the pages were, something called bleed and trim, where actually to cut the pages when it came time to lay them down. And most importantly, they wanted to make sure that they were self-contained. So the idea that all of your fonts were embedded, for example, was a key aspect to the standard. And really, as I said, the first time that these sorts of requirements were laid down into PDF. It also introduced this idea, as I mentioned before, of a conforming viewer. What's necessary to ensure that the viewer does the right thing with all of this data? So there are a number of different versions of PDFX. Um, these are the most important. PDFX1A is the one that has been the standard since 99. It is the one that is in use pretty much around the world um, when it comes to printing. Everybody knows it, everybody accepts it. Um, you know, it's had a long run. X3 has existed almost as long, but it's not used as much. And the reason is because 
X1A is focused on, as I said, CMYK and spot colors, the standard way in which printers think about color. They don't have to do anything special. It just works. X3 is for color managed workflows. And while um, a color scientist would tell you that that's a better way of doing things, most printers don't understand or don't get all of the intricacies. It leads to problems if they don't have all of the right pieces in place. And so while it's actually gotten some traction here in Europe historically, it's not a very big um, standard. Um, some people usually point out at this time that where's two? Um, we pretend that it never happened. There actually is an X2, but we don't talk about it. So, you know, pretend I never mentioned it. Um, I should point out, actually, if anyone has any questions at any time, raise your hand, scream out. Um, I'm happy to, to ask, answer anything you need to know. So the newer one, though, so in 2008, we finally brought PDFX into the, the new millennium with moving it from what was historically PDF 1.3, so pre-transparency, pre-modern compression algorithms. We now came forward to PDF 1.6, and we got the modern PDF. So we got transparency, optional content or layers, modern compression like JPEG 2000, and various other things. And X4 is now becoming, slowly, but it's becoming the new standard for the print industry because printer, or I should say designers, have been working with transparency in their authoring applications, whether it's in design or even Microsoft PowerPoint, for a long time. But when it came to print, that became very problematic. Now that transparency can remain live throughout the process. They can use uh, layers and optional content for regional versioning and various other use cases. So we're moving the world here. And in fact, there's an organization that started here in Ghent and bears its name called the Ghent Work Group, or the Ghent PDF Work Group, which is setting the standards for the print world and now based on PDFX4. So these are the ones you're going to see most significantly and the ones in the PDFX world that we really care about. But just to be complete and, and because they're interesting from a technical standpoint, I'll present some of the other ones in the PDFX world. There is something called X4P. It was actually created for the European newspaper industry. They were really, real. they said, we will not sign off on this standard unless you put in this feature. Just, you have to do it, it is a must. Screaming, yelling, it was, very, it was really a very tense situation in the standards body. They were gonna veto it. You know what? They've never implemented it. We put it in the standard, it's never been implemented. Well, I mean, let me phrase that. Products like Adobe Acrobat and, and Callus and others implement it, but nobody uses it. So um, it's interesting. It was a cute idea, but it's sort of an, a, an interesting story in the world of standards that somebody could, could be so adamant about something, but never actually bother to use it in the long run. So politics at work. Uh, more interesting in some ways is uh, PDF X5, and we'll actually talk about another standard that's based on it. X5 by itself has not gotten very much traction. It comes in three flavors. The most important one is the 5G, um, which has to do with external graphics and the idea that you don't have to have everything bundled together. You can have references to things. Standalone, these guys have never, as I said, gotten any traction. They're not used. They're great standards, but again, they're not really being used. But I'll talk about shortly something called PDF VT, and it is based on PDF X5 and how that actually is seeing a lot of traction. So we'll talk about that shortly. But let's move out of the realm of printing and talk about archiving. Frank mentioned this as well this morning. Very, very important. So PDF-A is probably one of the most well, other than PDF itself, the most widely known of the subset standards. And in fact, it is standardized along with PDF proper in over 50 countries around the world. Um, just last week, in fact, India um, standardized both of them, adding to that large and growing list of countries uh, around the world that have chosen to standardize. Also, the EU. Um, has utilized it in various ways and incorporated it into EU standardization. 
um, by many of these bodies. It's part of EU, various EU mandates, including the um, new 460 in the area of digital signatures and digital identity. So very important standard. Um, of course, I'm somewhat biased. I also happen to be the project lead at ISO for it, but it is an important standard regardless of my participation. The idea here with PDFA was to establish a standard for being able to take this digital data and make sure that it lives for long periods of time. And again, take out the stuff we don't like, add in the stuff we do, tighten it down, make it a good solid set of, of material. This happened in October of 2005 was when this standard was published. That was PDFA1. That's what most people think of when they say PDFA. Okay? A lot of specifics. We want a solid lockdown. Basically, this was that static e-paper model based on PDF 1.4, but without the transparency model. Well, just recently, this past June, we finally published PDF A2. And as you can see, if we just look at the green bits, the actual changes aren't very large. Really, what we did was we moved from PDF 1.4 to ISO 32000. That's the new ISO version of PDF. We'll talk about that shortly. And we added support for the new features. So we now get transparency. We now get optional content, uh, attachments. One of the big ones, and, and Paolo will talk about this later, is that PDF A2 is now aligned with the European Digital Signature Standard called PADES, PDF Advanced Electronic Signatures. So this means that every digitally signed PDF A2 file is compliant with PADES. You can't do it any other way and be compliant. So this is huge. You sign this document, you're compliant with the EU standards. Um, really, really big, significant advancement in PDF and in digital signatures. And we'll learn more about that this afternoon, I'm sure. We also made one more additional change. We have a PDF A3, which is coming out, fingers crossed, he says. Uh, we'll ratify it in May. We have a meeting in the middle of May. Um, we should ratify it at that time and then publish it, you know, hopefully not too many months later. And again, not one change. And the big change here is that before you could only have other types of PDFA embedded in another PDFA. Now you can take any type of document and incorporate it. And this provides some great functionality if, for example, and we'll go back and we'll use the invoicing example, you want to take the XML data that represents that invoice in a standard like EBXML or UBL or the like. You take that XML data, you put it into the PDF, which is your visual representation. Maybe you digitally sign it. And now you have a single document that is both human readable and machine readable and compliant with international standards, PDFA and whatever the invoicing standard is, or the CEN-E invoicing standard, and you distribute it, and you place it in your archive, and you're good. And you have this long-term solution for both machines and for humans. Big win, and we're seeing a lot of people adopting this model of combined PDF plus XML or PDF plus other standards PDF is the wrapper, containment of whatever the other data is, apply standard signatures such as PADES. It's a really nice combination, and we think this is going to be a huge driver going forward in a lot of places. One of the other ones, and I won't spend too much time on this one, is PDFE. This is for the engineering market. PDFE1 came out in 2008. Um, unfortunately, it's had pretty much zero traction in the industry. Um, and the main reason was, while it is a great standard and it really did talk to engineers, the only major thing that it gave them was support for 3D, which is good, but it didn't, it was hard to explain the differences between regular PDF and PDFE. There just wasn't a significant enough difference that people were willing to go to the extra lengths to make it PDFE compliant. So it's really had no traction in the marketplace. But what we heard from the engineering community was, we need to archive this stuff. PDFA, which we just talked about, has no support for 3D. 
No support for anything interactive. No movies, no video, no 3D. And, and that didn't work, of course, for the engineering market. So, but they needed to archive it. They wanted to take these 3D documents and put them away in their archives. And we see this because groups like Boeing, Airbus, and the like are using 3D PDF significantly. Uh, Airbus, for example, just to give you an idea, has a quarter last I heard, and this, this number is actually probably a few years out of date, but at least a couple of years ago, they had over 200 million documents with 3D data embedded in them. Okay, and that's a couple of years ago. So, and that's just Airbus. So keep that in mind that this is a growing industry, but they have a need for archiving. So what we're doing now at the standards level is we've started the process of PDF E2, which will be the archival version of PDF E. So we're taking all of the things we've learned from PDF A over the years, what we've learned from studying the engineering community, we're aligning it with 32,000 part two, and I'll talk about that shortly, and bringing them exactly what they need. New capabilities, geospatial information, advanced 3D capabilities, combined with a better format focused on the archival nature. And that's the goal, and we're going to keep moving this forward, uh, and it's currently in development. Ballpark, probably another year, year and a half before we finish it. All right, there we go. So I mentioned I talk about PDF-VT. Again, I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but I do want to bring it to your attention. This is a standard that, for the print industry, but for a very specific segment of the print industry, the variable and transactional publishing piece, which is probably one of the few parts of the print industry that's still growing and that's still making money. Uh, and the focus here is how do we ensure that these large documents, uh, these are tens, hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of pages, I mean, very or larger in some cases. We want these things printed out, and they're variable. Variable meaning that we're inserting pieces from other places. We're bringing in common graphics. We're putting in your name. We're putting in various other, place, various other pieces of data as part of the printing process. And that's where that X5G that I mentioned comes in, because those are the external elements. Now, these are pre-composited or pre-generated. We're not like laying out text on the fly that doesn't fit into the PDF model or the PDF printing model. But we want these pre-generated pieces to all come in. So we have a template, if you will, and we know where the pieces are going to go. And it all gets done by the rip and combined by these job ticketing elements. And so we have standalone versions, that's VT1. We have these many piece versions, that's VT2. And we even have a streamable version, that's 2S. So we've really now are pushing the print industry. Um, print industry has their big conference this year called Drupa. And this is going to be, we think, one of the highlights of the Drupa conference, as many vendors are going to be showing their PDF VT implementations this time around. So very exciting for that industry. I'm not going to talk about it as much as I probably should, but I do want to make you very much aware of a new standard, and new meaning that it's going to be ratified also at literally any day now, actually, uh, which is PDF-UA. UA stands for Universal Access. Now, there's a, a long-standing history of people saying PDF is not accessible. PDF can't be used by blind individuals, by people with other sorts of um, accessibility issues. Um, nothing is further from the truth. PDF has been accessible for a long, long time. But what's been missing is sort of best practices or rules that can make a PDF file really play well in that world. And so PDF UA is a combination of three pieces. So it's the file format, as we've talked about with the other standards. How do we make sure, what do we put into this file to guarantee that it has all of the necessary bits for um, working in an accessible world? If you've um, been in the web world or you've thought about this, there's another standard called WCAG, W-C-A-G. It's the web standard for accessibility. PDF-UA is how WCAG plays with PDF. Um, they align together very, very closely. 
Um, it also explains how viewers should interact between the document and accessibility, and then also how it's called an accessibility device um, or accessible technology, AT, also plays. This is becoming extremely important because, again, governments around the world are mandating the need for documents to be accessible to every one of their constituents. You can't, governments are not allowed to put a document up on the web, send out a document in email that can't be read by anyone or can't be processed by anyone. Okay, especially true if you're going to collect taxes and, the blind, and a blind individual can't read the tax form, that's a problem for the government. The blind guy is probably very happy, but you know, government would like their taxes regardless. So it's extremely important. And this is going to be the standard that's going to be mandated in the world of PDF for making that happen. And we're seeing that already start. The German government is already looking to incorporate this into their legislation, the U.S. government and others. So extremely important. But I saved what I think is the best for last. Let's talk about PDF proper. All right. So what's happened with PDF? So we're going to go back a while now. So in 2007, so five... Yeah, so just over five years ago, we, we being Adobe, announced that we were and proceeded to turn over the PDF standard from our control to that of the ISO. And we did it. And within a year, so in March, I think it was March, no, May of 2008, so a little over a year after we turned it over, the ISO published ISO 32000-1, it's a nice, easy to remember number, especially for programmers. And it is the standard. So we don't, talk about PDF, we don't talk about the Adobe PDF specifications anymore. This is the standard, this is the document that we all refer to, we reference and we work from. It is the international standard for PDF. And what it was, was not just taking the Adobe document and signing off on it. That, that Adobe themselves, we didn't feel that was appropriate. We wanted a document that really reflected how ISO works, how international standards work. And we sort of gave it three pillars. So we wanted to make sure that all of the existing documents out in the world, or at least ones that were reasonably compliant, continued to be so. We didn't want to break, for any, for, without a good reason, we didn't want to break any existing documents because there are billions of PDFs out there. They needed to comply with this international standard. We wanted to ensure, just like with the other PDF standards, that there were a set of rules for what a viewer should or shouldn't do. A basic set. You know, people had expectations based on years of working with Adobe Reader. That we wanted to ensure that that continued in the standards world. And then, of course, we wanted to make sure that it was a proper ISO standard. And so out of the 1,200 and something pages, a lot of it was rewritten, cleaned up. We had to remove references to Adobe, make it all general. And again, within that little over a year, we now had the international standard. And with that, it created what I like to refer to as the umbrella of PDF standards. So within the ISO, as we've seen, there's now PDF itself as 32,000 and all of those subsets living under the umbrella. So it gives us this complete picture of PDF standardization all controlled by you, by us, by the world, and not by any one individual organization. In fact, just to give you an idea of how not in control Adobe is, the current chairs of the 32,000 committee, there's two of them, one of them works for Microsoft. Okay, so we are just members like anyone else, and you can all be members. Bruno, I think, has recently joined and is participating. Um, others, anyone can join and participate. There's no cost. Just join, read the documents, give us your comments, participate, come to meetings, either remotely or physically. We welcome participation. So that's PDF 1.7. That's the PDF we all know and love. But the committee has not been stagnant. We've been moving forward towards what we call PDF 2.0. It uh, will be PDF 2.0. That'll be the version in the headers in the document. It'll be ISO 32000 Part 2. And we have four goals, uh, if you will, and you can see them here on the screen. We wanted to enhance the language. Um, 
but we wanted it to be evolutionary, not revolutionary. We didn't want to totally rewrite it into something else. We wanted to refine it, clean it up. I'm going to talk more about these. We wanted to deprecate things that really made no sense in today's world that were really hugely historical. And we wanted to do more work on standardization. And this being, and this was extremely important because this was the first version of PDF that from the start was controlled and handled by the ISO group. 32,000 part one still came from Adobe. You know, it was cleaned up, was done. We had a little bit of work we did at the ISO level, but it's still pretty much an Adobe document. With this one, with PDF 2.0, from start to finish, all done by this international standards body. And so we really wanted it to be owned, and it has been owned by the committee. So there are new features that have been added to the language. Uh, we have some new rich media capabilities, improvements in 3D. Uh, PADES is now an integral part of 32,000 itself. So again, great alignment with other standards groups. We have things such as associated files, document parts, uh, great enhancements to tagged PDF and structure and accessibility, and many, many more things um, that have been added. It's not really many more. Um, on the whole, it's not huge, but it's significant for certain market segments. Nice advances for printing, for engineering, for accessibility. We focused on very particular market segments and tried to help those segments in improvements of things they hadn't had previously in PDF. We wanted to clean up the language, um, make sure that ambiguities that had been there for a while were cleaned up, it, things to make it easier for new people entering the PDF space. Because the PDF space continues to grow every day. Um, I just came, uh, the last two days, I was in Basel, Switzerland, for a conference held by a group called the PDF Association. Um, there were 80 developers from around the world talking really deep technical about PDF. Um, I, I was amazed. The organization itself has 200 and some odd members, and it's just growing. Uh, even today, the PDF community grows, continues to grow. I talked more about standardization. So while we have the core PDF standard and we continue to evolve that, it still, with 32,000 part one, continues to refer to some Adobe documents and to some Adobe behavior. And we wanted to take specific parts of that and make them ISO standards as well so that there was no continued reliance on Adobe. Um, and that's something, of course, that Adobe has been very supportive of. So one of the areas is JavaScript. Um, the JavaScript implementation within PDF, the, the DOM, its object model, has been controlled by Adobe. We're now, we've now turned that over, or I should say parts of that, over to the ISO and we'll be standardizing the official PDF um, JavaScript object model as part of the standards process. We're also doing work with rich text. Uh, there's a rich text model inside a PDF and we're trying to bring that out of um, an Adobe controlled document and put that into the ISO standard as well. And as I mentioned, we wanted to deprecate things that really we don't need anymore. So probably the most interesting one um, is that PDF has a historical model for metadata called the Info Dictionary. Um, it's how we used to do metadata, uh, but it's evolved and been replaced by an XML-based model called XMP. But we've allowed both historically. As a PDF 2.0, the Info Dictionary is now officially deprecated, meaning you are not allowed to put one into a PDF 2.0 file. All metadata going forward, XML-based. Okay, so that classical model is history. Um, other things, insecure cryptography, things that have been security holes, such as certain classical video and, and audio models have been removed. You know, address things that the industry has found that we've just moved past over the years. Um, one of my favorites that I couldn't believe was still in there, um, those of you who have been using Mac OS for a long time may remember that prior to Mac OS 10, the old Mac OS had something called types and creators associated with the file system. That was still part of the PDF standard. We finally got rid of it since Apple got rid of it, we figured we could get rid of it too. Um, so that's all gone uh, and various things. So where are we in the process? 
Uh, we are in, we've been through a bunch of committee drafts. We're now in what's called the Draft International Standard or DIS phase. We're in the first DIS. We expect at least a second DIS. Um, and then depending on who you ask, we may or may not have to go to a third. Um, there's a debate in the committee right now as to how much longer we want this to go on. Uh, a group of us, myself included, would like to see this out sooner. Um, there's another group that would like to take more time. Um, what does that mean in real world? Um, personally, I think we could be done by early 2013. The other group thinks we could do it not till 2014. You know, what's the difference in a year? I think a lot. But we'll see. It's a committee decision, and we'll see how that goes. And as I said, there's still time for you to get involved. We're not done. Nothing is locked down and frozen, and we would welcome anyone and everyone's participation in that. So let me go ahead and wrap up. Somewhere. There we go. Okay. Uh, as you saw, there's a lot of standards. And for some users, and maybe even for some developers, it can be confusing. When do I use PDFX, or A, or E, or VT, or UA? Which is the right standard for the right thing? We as the standards community have tried very hard to keep those focused. If you're a printer, PDFX, or PDFVT. If you're concerned about archiving, PDFA. If you're concerned about accessibility, UA. Now, None of these are standalone. They were all designed to work together, meaning that you can have a file that conforms to multiple standards. So it would not be uncommon, and in fact, it will be very common, we think, to have a file that is both archivable and accessible. So it would be UA and A. It's also very common to have a PDFX and PDFA compliant file because you're printing it and then you're going to put it into an archive. So these are not separate and distinct things. You can and do, people do, bring them together and deliver combined solutions. But it is focused on the solution. And if you don't have a specific market segment, that's okay. That's why we have 32,000 proper and the need to focus directly on the core PDF standardization. So just to sort of you know, bring it to a close, as I said, there are billion, literally billions and billions of PDFs out there, and we, those are ones we just know about. You can do a search on the web. You know, Google will tell you how many billions of files it knows about. We also know that there are, and these are, again, ones we know about. Uh, the U.S. court system is one of my favorite examples. The U.S. court system just itself, and this is the federal courts, not our states or anything else. Our federal court system has over half a billion documents in its repository. Okay? That's just one organization. You know, multiply that out, think about various enterprises and other organizations. The number of PDFs that have got to be out there is staggering. PDF is not going away. PDF is continuing to evolve and meet new and existing needs both at the format, but also I think, and this is where iText comes in, is in the tooling. There's so much that can be done to make, to produce new documents, to take all of these billions of existing documents and make them more useful, repurposed, and put into different places and in different usages. Okay? And that's what hopefully you are building around the great technology that, that Bruno and team are providing with iText and think about how you can leverage those documents. The products keep building. Hopefully you're adding to that PDF ecosystem or providing the tools, whether it's internally to your company or to the world at large, whether it's open source, whether it's commercial. Continue to build, grow, and advance the PDF ecosystem. So with that, I'll thank you. Um, and I guess I have a little time for questions if anybody has